welcome everybody to the third and final of a three-part webinar series as part of the AASA SEL cohort in its second convening this fall after first convening in the spring. Uh, my name is Dr. Michelle Wilkins. We're gonna do introductions in a moment, but I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, who Right at School is in our partnership with AASA. So Right at School is a national after-school provider. We're based out of the Chicago area as our home office and where we first began in the Chicago Public Schools, but we are um, all over the country from New York to Georgia, Washington State, Texas, uh kansas to california and today we have the opportunity to continue the dialogue with this cohort on a topic that we heard from all of you that you want to hear about and so this comes from your spring feedback to aasa saying you know we love all this stuff we're bought into to sel for sure but oh my gosh how do i do it on a shoestring or less and so today um, I'm really excited to have with you um, some of our friends from Silicon Historical District Number no. One in Washington State. Um, Silicon is a very special district, and uh, I will let Kathy and Mary explain why. But I had the pleasure of uh, meeting them uh, or meeting Kathy a couple years ago when I visited the district. They are one of our right at school partners, and. Um, she and I were sort of commiserating uh, <laughs> in joy and misery about our journey through our doctoral degrees. And, um, you know, Kathy was focusing her entire dissertation on SEL. And, and when I look at the work she and Mary have done in Silicon, it is just such a model. And yet they've done it, you know, in, in, real, in the real world space of resources that are you know, not always abundant. So I'm going to um, let Kathy and Mary um, um, talk about themselves and introduce themselves. So Kathy, do you, I've unmuted you if you want to go ahead and introduce oh. yourself. <laughs> Yes, hi, I'm Kathy Waite. Um, I'm the superintendent in Stillicum Historical School District in Washington State. We are a one high school, one middle school district. Um, we're right um, near Joint Base lewis McCord, between Tacoma and Olympia, if you know anything about Washington State geography, um, right on the Puget Sound. So we serve um, three different communities and our student population, we have 3,400 um, children that we that we serve in our district. I've been the superintendent here for seven years and was um, a HR executive director. Uh, I've been a teaching and learning director and also an elementary principal um, and a former kindergarten teacher. So lots to lots of work to do around SEL. Um, so I'm excited to be with you guys today and um, kind of talk about our journey that we've gone on. Um, and the most critical piece of our district in this work is Mary Snyder, who um, was recently um, recently became our SEL specialist for the entire school district. She's like a unicorn and we wish we could clone her, but there's only one of her. So I'll let her introduce herself. <laughs> Great, thank you, Kathy. Mary? Let's see, Mary, I unmuted you on my end if you wanna unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, you okay. can. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Um, my name's Mary okay. Snyder, and I do work here in the Stillicum Historical School District. I have been working as a SEL specialist. This is my second year in this position. Prior to that, I was an instructional coach um, here in the district, and I have worked a little bit in higher education and also as a reading interventionist and classroom teacher in elementary and middle school. Great, thank you very much, Mary. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let um, my colleague, Dawn, introduce herself. I'm gonna unmute her. Dawn, I've given you the power of voice, go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dawn Benitez, I'm Senior Director of Educational Partnerships for Right at School, uh, 24 years in public education. 
um, serving every role from classroom teacher on up to principal and assistant superintendent for curriculum and learning. Um, and super excited to uh, be here today to talk about uh, social emotional learning. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, and I'm Michelle Wilkins. As I said at the beginning, I'm the CAO for Right at School. And um, as part of a, a national organization, one of the privi privileges I get as a CAO is to steer the curricular content and training and methodology of all of our educators who are over 2,000 bodies across the United States serving in over 360 programs today. And as part of that, and in, in accordance with our founder, Dr. Dr. Mark Rothschild, Original Vision, our programs are heavily SEL infused, which is why we um, get to be partners with folks like Kathy and Mary and districts all across the country. So let me remind you, um, this is gradually gonna come up as I share my screen, some of the things we're gonna be covering today. Um, first, starting with like, how do we talk about this thing? Um, building up adult competency, connecting our initiatives um, to things already in play, um, using in and out of school time opportunities to extend SEL and just smart partnerships. But we are gonna frame it all under the guise of assuming that nobody here is rolling in resources because we're all part of public school districts. Um, I have had to mute everyone because we had some background noise. So if you want to comment, please put something in the chat or question box and um, our folks um, will answer and, and bring your questions to light as we go. For now, I'm gonna start with a quick poll. So you're gonna have to answer a question with your, with your computer. And it's just to find out what your role in your district is. I saw in the questions where some folks are from, but let's find out what you do with regard to SEL. So go ahead and click the closest answer to the question you see now. Okay, I'm about to close the poll if everyone's had a chance. Okay, let's look at the results. So you can see here that we have um, a nice mix of folks, um, all folks who have potentially, hopefully some say and uh, influence in how either the district strategy around SEL goes forward, the uh, distribution of resources, and how it plays out um, at the building level in everyday delivery uh, for students. Great, thank you for doing that. Let's go jump into one more poll right away because our first topic today uh, to quiz Mary and Kathy about is around how they have uh, successfully talked to different stakeholders. So um, I'm gonna ask you a question about kind of who for you is the hardest group to talk to. So go ahead and click. You may have multiple answers here, but just pick one for now. about five more seconds and I'll close the poll. Five, four, three, two. All right, let's see how we did. So I'm gonna ask you to kind of look at this and um, Mary and um, Kathy, anything here relate to you? Uh, yes, actually it does. <laughs> uh, how surprising. Um, yes, we, we, I'm surprised that it's 0% for principals though. That was the only thing that struck me and Mary's actually nodding her head too. Um, we, we've had to do a lot of work with the adults in our system around SEL, um, with leaders and teachers, uh, just so that their understanding of the fact that because we're focusing on the social emotional needs of our kids and of our staff that we're not kind of ignoring student behaviors or um, or saying it's okay not to have rigor in the classrooms. We've had to do a lot around that in strengthening adult competencies. Um, we're in a really high military community. 42% uh, of our student population is military connected. And we've had a heck of a time getting it rolling, um, making sure that board members and community members understand that SEL 
is the most important thing we can do as educators. Um, we have to pay attention to social, emotional, and mental health. And some people in our military um, community weren't quite ready to hear that. They want to talk about mm -hmm. AP and um, college courses and uh, just resiliency without any teaching of those skills. So um, that's where mm -hmm. we're coming from. That's a really good call out. That was something that struck me about your community when I visited was you literally walk around and there are folks in camouflage and a ton of veteran based businesses and four base, two bases with all four branches, right? Right there in Puget Sound, Kathy. Yes, that yep, that's correct. And and mm -hmm. we're right outside Joint Base Lewis McCord and and a lot of the housing is full and so they live on the outskirts of of the military installment. So we have lots and lots of military families um who mm -hmm. who just didn't know about social emotional learning yet. So that was a that was a huge stakeholder group that we had to capture their hearts right at the beginning and we we're still working mm -hmm. on it. <laughs> and how um, are you doing how did how did you do that initially and how are you doing it now a year or two into this journey? We we initially started, Mary and I have this conversation all the time. We started with, um, we actually did, um, I with my dissertation work, I did a, um, a survey, just a perception survey um, with the adults in our system. And the adults said, yes, teaching self-regulation, kids need to know how to self-regulate. Um, but I don't teach it. No one was teaching it in the classroom. So um, th they were kind of ignoring the social emotional needs. And so when we talk to parents and community members, we always connect it to an educational initiative um, and about class management and um, attendance. And we, we're always very deliberate in, in talking about it. Uh, the, the very first issue that we captured um, our military parents with was um, anxiety. We, we used that as kind of a platform for jumping off because we had so many little ones that were really struggling with school phobia and not wanting to be away from, from their parents. Um, it was happening all over the place in our schools. And uh, we connected that, hey, are you seeing this in your children, this kind of parenting thing, and how we can help support families and, and our educators and knowing what to do with this, with this problem. It was a problem, I mm -hmm. would say. Yeah, and I, you know, what I heard you say earlier too was you were using specific terminology like anxiety, like attendance, like self-management, like classroom management. And, you know, in the graphic here on this slide, it's very intentional because what I hear from um, SEL experts, both, you know, in, in K-12, in higher ed, in youth development across the country is that when you use SEL or social emotional learning as a term, you, you, you get either a combination, you want to get a combination of like head scratching and, you know, the board thinks you mean uh, anti-bullying and your parents think you mean positive behavior and your principals think something else and your teachers think uh, personal responsibility. And so what I'm hearing you say is that you've had success in your messaging talking about explicit topics and behaviors versus necessarily the SEL umbrella. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's completely correct. We, we've we done explicit um, instruction around social emotional learning and we're in now we're getting better at it. We're not quite there yet. I want to be an expert, but not quite there yet. Um, we're doing SEL integrated with that academic instruction too, um, mm -hmm. but very explicit because it's way too broad. Um, we had to connect yeah. it to something that our community was facing. It was an issue um, that people recognized and it was in interfering with learning. And so we kind of got people on, on board that way. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Roy who says, you know, like what about community members and folks who don't work directly with kids and families? How do you talk to them about this? I'm going to go ahead and jump in on this. Hi, Roy. Um, this is Mary. And I think that 
what's really interesting about our approach is that we have um, done some direct work with teachers, with staff, with principals, lots of professional development, but we've also done some community events and we've made sure to make contact with organizations in our community like the Kiwanis Club, like the public library branches um, in our space, the coffee shops, those places where um, community members are gathering. Um, we have a local museum that hosts um, talks uh, monthly or uh, periodically. And so we try to be present in those spaces as well with some of our messaging, with our um, event um, uh, publications or advertisements so that people recognize that when we're talking about the SEL competencies, um, you know, as a school district, we're able to talk specifically about with the kids, uh, work with the kids during the times they're in school, but these are skills that they are taking with them into the community. And so it's really important for the community members in all of these different spaces, the grocery stores, the churches, the libraries, um, to recognize that what we're teaching the kids in school around SEL are the things they're seeing in their spaces as well. And so bringing them into, um, in, inviting them into the events, um, we, ha we hosted, for example, with our Anxiety Focus uh, documentary film screening, and we had panelists um, that could speak to both what the students were experiencing at school and what families were experiencing, but also um, community supports for uh, all of, you know, everyone who lives in our area. I think that's Thank you, so Mary. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Michelle. I think that's so important. And, you know, building that common language um, throughout your organization is, is absolutely critical in order to, uh, you know, make this um, a game changer in how we're really, um, you know, educating our kids. And Thanks. if I could, and, um, could I just add yeah, one more thing? I, I yeah, was just thinking too, we're, we have an event here um, in Stillicum, our Apple Squeeze, and that's a, it's an event that um, is sponsored by community members, but the school district has a pretty strong presence at that event. And um, so again, we're sharing our message in the spaces where the community um, is coming together. Excellent. Um, I, I did want to share uh, this really impactful conversation tool that Silicon developed. Um, would one of you quickly speak to this before we move on to the next topic? Uh, sure. We um, are you talking about our calendar, Michelle? Okay, should be showing now. Okay, there we go. Um, this, <laughs> this makes me happy looking at it. Um, so for the third year in a row, we've published a calendar around social emotional learning. Um, we, uh, we send this out to all of our families and we publicize it on Twitter and Facebook and in our principal newsletters that are weekly. So it's based on the on the SEL competencies, but we took a different approach this year and based it around neuro ed. So the science of how our brain works and processes emotions and feelings. Um, it's been one of the best things we've ever done. <laughs> Um, we also have been certified, we're actually the first school district in the United States to be certified in neural education. We've had 70 now of our staff members um, attend some really powerful, powerful professional development around neural ed and how, how the brain functions. What we found our biggest stakeholder holdouts were some of our teachers um, when we started this work. They didn't have time, they said, to to focus on SEL and 
the way we captured their attention was to connect the science behind it. They're educators, they wanna know that it works. So once we did that, once we captured it with the science on how the brain and, and the managing emotions and behavior and all these feelings, um, we got our teachers on board and they have been strong supporters of SEL. And um, we actually have made it our only goal for the year the board voted. We Our only goal this year is social emotional learning, which was a big, big step um, for, for where we've come from. So yeah, we're proud of the calendar and it's, it's super fun. All our staff yeah. professional development um, centers around this work. Can you Excellent. speak or at and least it's, like take one day? It's hard to see on the screen. Like, can you just like, I'm looking at the April 2020 and I see there's a whole week of like deep purple, but I don't see the words. Can you just highlight kind of what that is? Um, so for the folks in the audience here, we at least get a kind of an idea of like what would be on that calendar. Sure. Um, the calendar is, a, this is a typical calendar a family might have by the refrigerator or somewhere in their home, you know, to schedule their soccer games and their club meetings and everything. Um, but each year we pick a theme. Last year's theme was the road to resiliency and we um, monthly have a different focus. And basically the structure this year is a neuroscience related to SEL term. And then um, there's a sort of simplified definition of that underneath. So if you take the April page, the amygdala, and then a definition of the amygdala below that. And then to the right, what we've done is we've added a couple of tips for families. So now that you know a little something about the amygdala, how can you um, use that, you know, to in your family life and um, so that's the tip to the to the right and then what you're seeing on the actual calendar pages these are actually dates related to the school year so um, that's probably spring break that you see in the dark purple and then our Wednesday early release days um, a couple probably half days um, there so the the bottom actual calendar page of it is more related to school school events and um, important dates connected to the school year. Mm -hmm. The top portion has the, the simplified definition and then some tips that are really meant to be like, what can families um, do with this little bit of information to just strengthen their yeah. student social emotional learning. Yeah, so this is just a great example and it is available as a PDF on Silicon's website if you wanna view the whole thing. It's, it is literally a page turner. Um, but it, it leads off with a letter from Kathy and then an overview of, of SEL and then goes into the monthly. But it's a, it's a beautiful example of reimagining an everyday district tool um, to empower and, um, and educate uh, your community. Um, let's do another quick poll as we think about, now this one could be funny. I'm gonna, <laughs> there's a little, uh, perhaps a little evil uh, horns coming out of me on this one, but, um, I want you to think about the people in your district, your workers in your, throughout your district community and very honestly answer a question about how, what you think of their capacity in social emotional learning. Okay, here come the four questions. Pick your best answer. About five more seconds. Okay, let's see how what we think. So, uh, Mary, and, and, and by the way, folks, even though we have to be muted because we had some background noise, please feel free to use the question box to ask questions like Roy did, and we can answer those throughout. Um, but for Mary and Kathy, it, how does this, these answers relate to what you saw in your own community, and how has your own community changed? Uh, we've seen big changes, but, but it's been, we've, this is a fourth, a fourth year of our journey. So we, we've seen some huge changes. Like I was in the classroom, uh, a classroom the other day, and there was a little fourth grade boy that said, I think I'm just an amygdala hijack right now. So that vocabulary piece is huge. The adult piece, what we found is, uh, our adults wanted to start with, oh my gosh, why do these kids have such poor 
social emotional skills. Why are, why are, is this happening? They can't regulate their emotions. So we had to shift the question to how can we ensure that our school climate at all of our buildings leads to the healthy development um, of each student. So that adult piece was huge. And we, we just kept kept at it with that question. It's not just about the skills we teach, it's about the environment that we're creating. Uh, and and that's been something that's been um, echoed over and over again um, these last four years. Mm -hmm. Mary, can I, kind of peeking at some of those questions on the right, um, what are some of those things that you've addressed in Silicon with the faculty you work with? I think um, one of the the things that, and Kathy kind of said that, is that teachers have a lot of questions about their students, right? So why do, why am I students having explosive behaviors? That's a really big one right now that we're, um, you know, having encountering what feels like to many teachers, this is happening more and more often. Um, and so that's kind of an in for us with with staff is their desire to want to address student um, explosive behaviors or students, you know, who aren't able to self-regulate. And then what we, what Kathy's um, describing is the importance of the mental model that teachers have about what a good student looks like, right? And how, and what does a school community look like? And so I think, um, for many of us who've been in education a long time, you know, we have been throwing around this word differentiation for many, many years now. And we have, again, lots of understandings about what that should look like. But I think one of the things that we realize in, when we start working with SEL competencies is that um, we have to have some understanding that kids are responding to stress um, in ways that that are sometimes unpredictable and the the community and the culture that we have built in our schools um, either supports their their regulation of those responses or sometimes it can increase dysregulation and so for teachers they're having to do a lot of reflection on the structures and supports that they are putting into place before kids are dysregulated. Like, what does it feel like when you walk into our school? What does it feel like? Um, do families feel connected? Do kids feel connected right away? And are staff modeling these competencies um, for, for each other and for the students? So we've been doing a mm -hmm. lot of uh, self-assessments. We've been doing a lot of um, smaller group uh, thinking about, you know, in grade level teams or in uh, department teams, like what does it mean for us to integrate SEL into our work? And, and what does that look like yeah. as um, kids are, are coming into our community? And I, if I can just take a second to address one of the earlier questions in connection with this, you know, we talk a lot in Stillicum about our community being military connected and that making us, um, you know, different than, than many other school districts. But I think that the challenges military connected kids are facing are similar to challenges that many of you all are experiencing um, with your students. All kids are struggling with a, of a sense of belonging, right? That's a, that's one of the very first things that we address. Do you have kids in your spaces who feel like they belong or don't belong, right? Uh, we all have students who have ACEs and who have experienced um, mobility, you know, they're moving often in and out of, of schools and districts. And these are all challenges that are common to us across districts. And, and they're challenges that um, when we increase the adult capacity to engage with them, um, we're going to increase our students' social, social emotional learning competencies as well. Excellent. Well stated, Mary. Um, Dan, I see your question, and I think it's going to tie into a slide we're coming up on, so just hang tight on that. Let's do one last quick poll, everyone. And this is really um, kind of goes to the title of our session today around resources, but I'm going to ask you to sort of tell us about the nature of resources in your district. What's your reality?
a couple more seconds. Okay, so we look like we have just a few who are feeling pretty lucky. Uh, most are have, you know, have, a, have a, a good bit of resources, but others are feeling strained. Um, how, do his, how have resources, um, Kathy, as your district has increased its focus under your leadership for uh, SEL, how have the resources followed or not followed in accordance? Uh, I would say the resources have definitely followed, um, but we've had to kind of prove with data that it's working. So like Mary was talking about, we, we take lots and lots of data that it's working so that we can justify that the resources are going to the right places. And they and we I feel like they are, um, and we're seeing changes. Um, we also are very, very deliberate when we do any anything we connect it to SEL so like when we're doing safety improvements and and we all know that um, safety initiatives are more than just lock doors and ID badges they're about that sense of belonging and and the kids and the relationships and the the climates of our schools. So we really make a deliberate effort to point it out. So, you know, we're doing this resource, but we're also spending on this SEL piece because it all fits together. So I, I feel like most of my job is kind of putting the puzzle pieces together for people connecting the dots. Um, and I'm, I think I repeat a lot because every message we have, it's around social emotional learning to try to get the, the point across that our recess resources are going to SEL because that's the most important thing. Um, but it's hard. It's, it's definitely challenging. There's, there's never enough funding or resources or, um, and kids needs are, are so dramatically different from one place to another. And, and we need to put those supports in place. I'm going to jump in really quick here to, to ask you to add and go a little bit deeper. When we talk about the resources, obviously there's the human capital in regards to resources, and there's also resources and things that are needed, curricula, et cetera, um, for that. And so when I think about the human capital, what kinds of things are you doing for around SEL to support not only students, but also to support staff? Yeah, I yeah that professional cap that's the most critical piece. So, um, like I said, our our entire focus area, our strategic plan is all around SEL. So every professional development opportunity um, is around social emotional learning. Um, we connect it to everything that we do um, to create an equitable um, educational system. Um, and Mary does most of this professional learning for our staff by her self um, and and building that capacity at buildings like train the trainers and and getting getting other people on board so that they can continue the work and uh, I would also say um, one of the challenges or one of the questions that I've had superintendents ask me often is you know do we need to buy an SEL curriculum is that you know the route you want we want to go and I think what's super important about Kathy's message to us and what has really made it um, SEL, I think, accessible to everyone is this idea that um, we are integrating SEL skills and competencies with the cognitive development of our students. So we understand, you know, we are we have common core standards, we have um, you know, standards-based grading. We have all of those things that, that we are held accountable to, but we also are connecting and integrating the SEL competencies across the cognitive and academic um, content as well. I think that's super important. We we all uh, have saw how when Common Core Standards came out, you know, a lot of teachers felt like they could opt out of those and we had to do a lot of work helping science and social studies teachers understand you know their role in literacy and math development as well but I think what we want to do is we want to make sure that every person in our district feels a responsibility for supporting students social and emotional well-being the training this year um, specifically has extended beyond teachers and um, education assistants 
to our transportation um, staff, to our food services staff. I'm leading um, trainings monthly with our district office um, personnel. So, so people who, you know, very often our professional development is focused on our teachers. Um, a, another huge uh, area of training this year, um, directed and focused training is for our administrators who often are not part of the professional development days, right? They're present during those days, but often have other tasks that they're doing when teachers are in seats uh, learning. So um, expanding the training, the professional development to include other um, stakeholders who haven't traditionally been part of professional development, that's one way. Integrating the SEL skills and competencies across um, the curriculums. We, we did purchase um, the zones of regulation for our K-8. Every K-8 classroom teacher has that, but I will say that what's nice about a curriculum like zones is, again, there aren't you know, you don't get 30 textbooks with that curriculum. And it's really about teachers developing lessons and, um, and incorporating strategies that respond to their students' needs. It does give us a common vocabulary across the district by which to, you know, engage with this, um, uh, these ideas. I think also a key thing has been connecting SEL with neuroscience, especially for our secondary staff. So our middle school, our high school teachers, principals, staff members, they see something like the zones of regulation as being for little kids, you know, they will say things to me like, you know, 15 year olds don't want to say they're in the red zone or the yellow zone, which often I actually find to be untrue. But I think that um, by connecting it to the neuroscience, it really helps to give meat to the ideas and not just let them be considered kind of these fluffy, you know, the feel good things elementary teachers want to do. Um, those are, are really key things. Also, we make really strong use of our counselors. We have um, connect community connections with community-based mental health professionals who are coming into our schools um, and offering services there. We have a school-based social worker. Um, we've really tried to incorporate all of our staff members into, into this work. That's exciting. And it makes me think about, um, I've been doing a lot of traveling um, and listening to districts speak specifically to um, how they've created new positions, um, you know, to be able to support this so that it is this holistic view um, and that, you know, that the culture, because obviously it, what you're saying and really kind of putting it all together, it's the culture has to be there so that everybody understands that common language and it's expanding. So I think you've really done a great job of kind of talking about how you're doing that. How have you, would you say, you know, what are some of those challenges, just because I want to be um, cognizant of people's times, you know, what are some of those possible challenges that you're, that you're seeing as you've kind of worked to get all the wheels going together um, in the same direction. How are you, um, you know, working through those, some of those challenges? Uh, we have this conversation a lot. So if we could back it up and, and do some things over again, um, Mary and I would have started with modeling adult SEL competencies. Um, we, we've tried to attach the adult SEL um, work to like our wellness policy and um, job satisfaction and we want our people to love it here and love what they do. Um, so we did all this staff wellness and SEL, but we didn't start with um, the adult competencies of SEL. We really didn't set a a baseline for that. Um, we're we're playing catch up with that now. We started. We jumped right to the the student skills and competencies, and um, I, I feel like we should have started with the adult. So that was a challenge. The other challenge was um, the people that just didn't want to fit into our philosophy and our important work. Um, that's been a challenge, and some of those people have chosen 
um, or coach to, to leave, but even like community organizations that had been part of like before and after school programs or, or things in the past, we wanted everybody on the same page. And that, that's been a hard thing to get. We, we don't invite any community partnerships or stakeholders in that aren't exactly on board with, with our SEL focus. So with that, you know, kind of um, to a couple of questions together, I know you've kind of talked about how you're working to do that. How are you working to ensure that it is integrated and how are you checking for competency to ensure that um, you're meeting your benchmarks? I think this is a really important um, question because uh, again, we don't want it to be a half an hour with the counselor once a week, right? And, and that's a pretty typical model um, in a lot of schools, or even for the teacher to say, well, I'll hear some teachers say, well, you know, Wednesdays we have an early release, and so I find I have flexibility in my time, and so I add in the zones lesson on Wednesdays. What's really been key in the professional development has been to acknowledge that obviously there does need to be some direct instruction and structured lesson planning specific to the SEL competencies, but then, um, you know, in the same way that they are incorporating math practice or literacy throughout their day and throughout their week, they need to be recognizing SEL as that as well. So um, one thing that we do is we try to label um, different teacher moves with the SEL competencies. So when I go into a classroom and I do classroom observations and then I take notes and talk with the teacher, I explicitly say to the teacher, here is a space in your day when I observed you building in self-regulation, where I observed you um, build, you know, emphasizing relationship building skills with your kids, where I observed you um, uh, allowing your kids to have self-efficacy, like how are they, these these SEL competencies being expressed in the classroom, a lot of teachers um, and staff members don't recognize that they're reinforcing that in their practices already, and then um, and then the challenge becomes like how how do you then sort of generalize that to the rest of the school and to you know periods throughout their day so some of the ways that we hold um, staff kind of accountable to this is um, emphasizing with principles right the importance and kathy's role in just sort of reminding them and putting it in front of them over and over again in her conversations with them it's it's actually become part of their the principal evaluation. It, it's in my evaluations of our principals, I'm expecting them to model and point out those SEL competencies, and so it's part of our conversation as well. So there there's kind of an urgency to the work, I think, and and that helps kind of check all the buildings. Are we really doing what we say is important to our system? Um, and and we we do like today we launched launched a survey out to the community and to staff um, checking our SEL work. So we launched a question. And um, so that perception data we're getting all the time. And then we're also tracking data points like um, consultations with with staff and, and students. We're, we're tracking attendance and discipline. We're tracking um, availability of the sensory spaces that have been created in our buildings. Um, that, that's been great data to show that, hey, we're giving these kids these these um, these spaces to take their brain and kind of relax and um, reset. Uh, is it working with with students and and getting them back to the classroom? I think this is Michelle. I'm just gonna if I can just jump in quick. I think um, you know one of the most important things I heard in the last year around SEL was by Dr. Dale Blythe from the University of Minnesota, who I is a, a peer of mine on the National After School Board, but he also is kind of the father of youth development um, and has been studying and writing about SEL long before it was called that. And one of the things he said was in K-12, and this kind of, Dan, goes to your question. He's like, in K-12, we run the risk of, you know, explicitly teaching SEL in a sort of contained, separate, 
lesson period part of the day instead of integrating it. But because SEL is really SED, it's really development, right? And like any other uh, type of development, like cognitive development, it is, it is more caught than taught. So it is about setting up, as you're describing so beautifully, Mary and Kathy, it is about setting up conditions and environments and opportunities for it to be caught because it is, as a developmental piece, it is both uh, an end, a means to an end and an end in and of itself. And so I think you've done a really great job describing how well you can integrate it, not just in a school day, but across your school system. Can I just say one one last thing related to that, and 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 that is, I think, um, I I kind of really like that phrasing that you had that we fall into this trap, right? Because part of of the trap that we often fall into in education is that we're looking for an answer that will fix something quickly, and that I can you know have very clear this is what it was like before and this is what it's like now. And what what we understand exactly what you said that this is a process of development, and that is a challenging message for school board members to hear for teachers to hear, you know, they send me an email, I, you know, and they want help and I go to help them and they think that there's a sense that when I come and go, it's going to be fixed. And it's not, you know, it can't be that way. Brains develop over time, um, behaviors develop over time. And as students have myelinated particular neural pathways to a fight, flight, or freeze response, it's going to take time to develop and grow new neural pathways. That doesn't happen in two or three days. It doesn't happen in one week. We can chart progress, but we're not going to suddenly have a different kid because they engaged in social emotional learning, you know, curriculum or, or lessons. I think that's a super important um, uh, point. And then the second point I just want to make, and, and then I'll let you go on to the next slide, is that I really want to kind of call out a, the, the challenge around um, extrin extrinsic rewards of, of um, preferred behaviors. So that, again, seems like an easy, quick, let's let's do this positive reinforcement, extrinsic rewards. And what we recognize is for the most challenging students or the students experiencing the most challenge, those kinds of extrinsic rewards it, it very soon actually become punishments for them because they're not earning and everyone else is. And so we want to be careful that we're not growing extrinsically more good behaviors or preferred behaviors from students who are already doing it and increasing the unpreferred behaviors through these sort of quick and easy seeming fixes. I really appreciate you saying that because um, it re that really is important. It is a, it's a long game and it is about development over time. And, and with that, just so we, for the sake of time, I want to just get to our last question and thinking about, you know, partnerships and the importance in, of recognizing that, you know, we can't do this alone. It takes a village. Um, and so what types of partnerships, um, you know, are you using to support your goals? And when you think about taking advantage of these, how does it not, you know, create more burdens? with um, what you already have going on? Um, well, I, I think the, the most important thing that we've done is um, we've aligned. I mean, our focus is really clear and we've given people the permission. I, sometimes I think teachers just need permission to focus on something because um, they're so busy. So everybody knows that's what we're about. We want to create the sense of belonging um, and relationships for our kids. And we want staff to feel like they belong. So when we look at community partnerships, we're looking for that same sort of relationship building. We want, we want partners that will, will be with us for the long haul and will connect with the kids and the families um, that they're not, they're just 
they're about building the relationships. That's first and, and, and foremost in any partnership we have. And we have a lot of great community partnerships. Um, and they've changed over the last several years based on our work around social emotional um, focus. Um, but we're really deliberate about, about who we want around our kids for these welcoming, caring environments that we're trying to create and, and stress. Yeah, and this is Michelle. And, you know, one of the things we, I, I came, Dawn and I both came from the K-12 school day and now focus on the out of school time and the incredible math <laughs> is just that the out of, the time children spend in out of school time programs is actually equal across the course of a year to what they spend in school. So if you're out of school time partners are aligned with the same types of things you're trying to accomplish, whether it's around SEL or math or literacy or character building, whatever, um, that is doubling your impact on the kids without potentially any extra effort on your school day team. So just consider that as you vet new partners, as you assess your current partners, it's sort of a, an often missed opportunity if we only think about the nine to three. Absolutely. And even like the before school time can impact a student's day for the entire, if they don't have a good start where they're feeling um, successful and happy and supported, I mean, that, that will impact the entire school day. So I agree that out of school time is, is critical. Right. And we see that in partner, like I've been to your school, I've been to Chloe Clark Elementary and, you know, seen kids being dropped off very early in the morning by their military parents and not necessarily going to see them again for a long time. And the, sort of that comfort and community that an out of school time partner can provide um, towards that just attending to the whole child is, is really vital. Yeah. Anything else to add here, Mary? Uh, yeah, I think this is part of why we have, you know, extended our professional development to include um, those partners and also our transportation, our food service, like anybody who's engaging with our students, with our families, we want to be sure that they're hearing this message and that, you know, if, if we ha are able to, that we support them in their training as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's super important and, and, and a major focus for us. Great. We have just another minute or two if anybody wants to pop questions in the question box. I would like to say for those of you going to the Washington, D.C. convening this Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of the cohort, you will have the pleasure of um, meeting uh, Kathy in person. She's going to be there on a panel that Dawn is leading on Monday afternoon, um, really listening to Kathy, as well as some of Dan Bridges, who's on the call, some of his colleagues, and uh, listening, learning from their wisdom, including their missteps. They're going to tell their horror stories, everything they did wrong, as well as right on their journey through different stages of implementation. I don't see any other questions popping up, and I want to be respectful of folks needing to be somewhere else on the top of the hour. So there's contact information for Don and I there in the bottom, if, at the bottom if you need anything, as well as our website if you want to know more about how we partner with folks around SEL in the out-of-school time. And thank you all for your participation and, more importantly, for your focus on this absolutely vital part of child development. Have a great rest of your day.